Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to the Art Challenge presentation. My name is Leif Pedersen. I am one of two artists in our uh, marketing team here at the Renderman Group. Hi, Vinod. Hi, Polami and Jason. Um, we're going to be going through a couple of things. We're going to be going through a little bit of the history of the art challenges, uh, where they are now, uh, premiering a new art challenge. And then we're going to welcome Dylan uh, from our team and Vincent from the Adobe Substance 3E team. And then we're going to close it off with uh, Oliver, who is our VP, and who's going to be uh, talking to Guido at the Adobe Substance 3D team and handing it off to see what uh, kind of magic they have. Um, in the middle, we're going to have Arvid Schneider, uh, an amazing artist, tell us a little bit about the new Substance plugin uh, for uh, RenderMan and how that all kind of ties into the new Llama workflows. So to get started, um, I want to uh, shoot the presentation up and uh, let's see if, if we can talk about the um, art challenges and their history a little bit. So what are the art challenges? The art challenges is, are an amazing opportunity to uh, educate yourself in, um, in RenderMan and all its bridge tools, uh, get Pixar feedback, um, and really improve your portfolio with an amazing piece after developing an image uh, for 90 days. And of course, you get some bragging rights. I uh, won a Pixar contest. and. And you can win amazing, amazing prizes. Um, so so far, th this is our eighth uh, challenge that we're, you know, we'll be premiering, and uh, we've uh, given away so far one hundred and twenty thousand dollars in value. So uh, that's pretty amazing. And our new challenge is, is our biggest uh, winning challenge yet. Um, of course, you know, I have to tell you about these things. The uh, the amazing entries speak for themselves. It's really amazing to kind of see our, our challenges uh, inspire us every time. You know, we go in there with these uh, really crazy goals and they, you know, outdo themselves every time. Um, so how does it all work? Well, it's, it's pretty simple. You make a RenderMan account in our forums and uh, you submit a challenge. You go to the Answers uh, platform and we have a little countdown clock and uh, you can read, you know, the, uh, the you know, the, the requisites to actually get everything going. And it, it, you have to kind of start a, a work in progress thread. So, um, you know, you kind of go through uh, your progress, you show us how you're doing, and uh, people are going to give you feedback. And we have amazing artists there to kind of guide you through this whole process. So, you know, we know that creation is daunting. You know, you have a lot of, of work and deadlines, and, and life in general can be very time consuming. So, I know we have, you have little time to do all these things. and. A lot of ambition so we're here to guide you um, and you know and this time actually have an ILM you know judge and uh, created a director at Adobe as a judge as well you know which would give us you know great feedback on tools and guidance for our challengers and our challenges come from everywhere our winners have uh, you know a huge range of backgrounds as well so you know, if you speak, uh, if English isn't your first language, I'm here to help in Spanish as well. And others, you can definitely go in there and bridge the gap with um, any other thing that you need. So, um, you know, and the challengers, uh, because of the tips and tricks, you know, the challengers aren't, you know, only uh, novice users. Many times they're professionals and they have a kind of amazing workflows in each of their work in progress threads. So I, I definitely, you know, motivate you to go in there, learn, um, and if you don't have time to, you know, actually submit a challenge, you can just give it a shot and and still learn. So, um, and to to uh, to premiere our new uh, RenderMan art challenge, I want to see you guys do a little uh, drum roll icon or or something to uh, get me started here. So uh, it's called the Iconoclasts, and it's our very it's our very first. There you go, <laughs> drum roll. Thank you. Uh, it's the it's our very first collaborative art challenge uh, uh, with Adobe, um, and their team has given us um, Matt, and we're going to be giving you guys the teapot. And you know the magic of of the art challenge, uh, you know besides winning, is is the amazing prizes. And this time we have 
over fifty thousand dollars in prizes. So um, it's it's an amazing you know reason to to try non-commercial. Go down there, download it. You know, a new version is out with all kinds of new awesome tools. So uh, you know, it's a it's a great way to get started in twenty four and learn something cool. So uh, you know, go to our learn page. You'll see. Uh, all kinds of tools to actually learn RenderMan and our challenge. And you can see past challenges, ideas for work in progress threads, and kind of understand what it takes to be a winner there. And our industry judges are going to be judging your entry after 90 days uh, in around November. And we're going to give you some feedback after that. And our new rubric has been updated. Now there's a lot more focus on narrative, not only technical. So make sure you're uh, you know always kind of uh, thinking about how um, how you're gonna uh, show this you know and not, not not only rendering but actually showing it as well in narrative. Um, so you know I was talking about portfolio pieces and you know we have uh, a finalist Luke Elwood and a, a winner Jeremy Heinz are actually now both at Pixar and many of our other winners have gone to amazing companies uh, like Netflix and uh, and a bunch of other great studios. So, you know, it's not only that you're playing to win, is that you're playing to kind of improve yourself, you know, and create something magical on your portfolio. Um, and, you know, what makes this challenge interesting is that, you know, you have to texture it with the new uh, Substance tools and uh, Material X Llama. That's what, that's what we, you know, the, there's a new judge from Adobe and ILM. So, um, Let's see here. And we have our new Adobe Substance integration. Um, it, it's a new unofficial um, RFSP plugin. That's a mouthful. And uh, it allows you to go from Substance and save things uh, automatically into our render map preset browser, which means you press one click. And it makes a Llama network, even with ACES color, a management. And you can uh, just drag and drop into your render man session. So, Hopefully that that makes it super straightforward to participate and make some of the more you know more difficult things uh, easier. Um, and uh, with that, I want to welcome uh, Arvid Schneider, uh, who's an amazing uh, artist, ex ILM, and uh, you know a fan of of Llama, has a lot of experience with Llama, and has an amazing YouTube channel. So go out there and subscribe. Hey, hi Arvid. Ellie, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited, and it looks pretty amazing. Um, so a little bit about myself. My name is Arvid, and yeah, I'm working currently in Vancouver as a, as a lead uh, lighting TD, and I've been in the industry for roughly 12 years, and a couple of them I was actually using Llama as well. So I have a fair bit of um, play time with Llama. Um, also, you probably might know me from my YouTube channel where I'm creating lots of training content um, for various DCCs and render engines. Um, from now on, I will probably be focusing a little bit more on Render Man, so make sure to, uh, to stay tuned and check out that. Um, in today's presentation, though, um, I want to talk about the Render Man plugin, how it's integrated in Substance, and how you can use it um, with various ECCs. And towards the end of my presentation, I also want to talk a little bit about um, Llama shading networks, how you can make use of them, what the benefits are. Uh, but before we get going, I want to show you a few material setups um, using Substance. Um, that's pretty much all. So I would say uh, let's give it a go and have some fun. The first thing I want to do is create a new layer, call it Spinner, and assign it to a custom material ID. Then I adjust a few shader parameters like roughness and color, and head over to the shader settings to enable subsurface scattering. Then I'm creating a new layer for the teapot's body. It will be a very dark material, so I'm choosing a very black albedo color. And for the specular roughness, I'm picking up a nice texture map to break up the roughness. On top of that, I'm also plugging in a procedural high frequency noise map to break up the surface using bump parameters. Now let's continue to the paint job. I'm first isolating the nozzle of the teapot and giving it a nice orange color. Then I'm enabling paint symmetry and starting to draw in the flames. Using anchor points and blur mask techniques, I'm able to create a nice outline around the flame. After that, I'm then colorizing the flame itself and the outline. For the final look, I'm adjusting the roughness and also adding some breakup through the diffuse color so we have some nice um, paint effect on it. 
Before showing off the new Random Man plugin, I first want to create one more material, which is um, a smart material, Iron Forged Old, which I'm dropping onto the teapot and then further refining it with custom masks. First up, I'm disabling all the layers and starting from the bottom to refine the first metal material and adjust the roughness accordingly. In the third layer, I'm adjusting the mask builder texture size to add a little bit more detail. On top of that, I'm adding a new fill mask to the third layer to add additional smudge and um, fingerprint effects, which I still have to scale to get a realistic size. To really make this metal pop, I'm creating a new matte finish on top of my layer stack to create this nice grungy used up look. On top of that, I'm adding an edge breakup to break up the edges to get a more used look of the metal. For the final step, let's add the subsurface scattering onto the spinner and then we are done with this metal material. As soon as you install the Renderman plugin for Substance Painter, you will see that you get this nice blue R logo on your toolbar on the right. Once you click on it, you will see the preset browser you know and love from other DCCs like Houdini and Maya. You will have all the standard shader balls, libraries and everything in here. You can add or create new libraries in here or you can view other ones you have previously installed. So I will head over to the custom library slot here and you can see I already have a few materials exported with this uh, new plugin. Before we export a material to the preset manager, it is very important to set up a few things beforehand. So the first thing you want to set is your texture resolution, which will be set for your export here. I am choosing 4096. Also, what is important when you create your new project, if you decide to use UDIMS or the UV workflow, um, this will be baked into the exported texture maps. So if you're using a UV workflow and you export a material that will be UV based and if you use a UDIM based workflow, the file paths will have the UDIM tags appended. So now let's make good use of this new plugin and export our flame material here. All you have to do is click that little shader ball with that plus icon and you get the create new material dialog. It is very straightforward and not a few things to set up because it's a, almost a one-click solution. So all you have to do is give it a nice asset name, let's just call it Flame Teapot. You can change the author name, the version, and you can pick the thumbnail preview option. You have the default one, you've got a fur one, none. And then in the Substance Painter options, you can choose which BXDF export you want to use. You have a few to pick. You've got the Llama Shading Network, the Pixar Surface Network, and the Disney Shading Network. For this presentation, I will be exporting a Llama Shading Network, and you can also pick color configurations. Um, you can just disable it all together, use ASUS 1.2, Filmic, Blender, or your custom OC CIO environment variable. On top of that, you can add metadata, any custom things you want to do, key value pairing, and you can just hit plus to create new ones. And then all you have to do to finalize this uh, material, you just hit save and it will start exporting this material. As soon as the material is exported, you will see you get a new thumbnail and with that little L icon in the corner, which represents a Llama shading network. You can also see we have the S for the Pixar surface shading network. And this is all you have to do with the plugin. So you export your materials from Substance Painter. And now let's jump into Houdini and I will show you how you get everything into Houdini or into Maya and how to work with that. All right, so now we are in Houdini and the first thing you want to do is create a new window tab and make sure you pick the RenderMan preset browser. And once you open that, you will see it's very familiar to the one you have in, in Substance Painter. And all you have to do to bring in any material in Houdini is you select the shader ball in the grid view. And all you have to do is then double click it and you will see that it will bring it into the material context and it will have the flame teapot name as we specified from Substance Painter. Now let's jump inside and have a look at the generated Llama network. The resulting Llama network generates several Llama nodes which help to set up the metallic roughness workflow from Substance Painter. As you can see here, we start in loading in the textures, we convert it to a Pixar metallic workflow, and then we create a Llama diffuse load, Llama SSS, and um, Llama conductor, which get all added together and then driven by a mixed parameter. On top of that, we add a dielectric, which helps to cre uh, create a code layer. And towards the end of the shading network, we also have a displacement slot. And all it comes down to is two shaders plugged into the output collect to generate your shader. 
So now let's have a look and see how this renders compared to Substance Painter. And the resulting render looks like the one in Substance Painter. And the beauty of the plugin is that once you export your materials, you do not need to worry about color conversions. It automatically generates the TEX files, which is used by RenderMan. So all the color spaces are set up correctly. All you have to do is import the material and hit render and you get this result right out of the box. And when loading up Substance Painter on the side, you can see the result is pretty much one-to-one. -one. The only difference is our light intensity, and that's quite easy to address. You would just go in Houdini, go to your lights, and just boost up the exposure a little bit. Maybe let's go uh, 1.3 stops. You can see it gets brighter right away. And this technique is very powerful. So you can have all the versatility in Substance Painter, do all these shaders and all the nice uh, material, smart masking, whatever. In Painter, just hit the export button using the RenderMan plugin and bring it into any DCC you would like. All right, so now let's do the same thing with the metallic shader we exported. So in the preset browser, you can go to your material library, find the shader or material you exported and just double click it. You will then see in your material context that you got a new shader imported. And then all you got to do is hit the IPR render button and your material will start rendering using it. You can see now it's already starting to cook up and you can see we get our nice metallic workflow. We get the nice reflections and everything looks very similar to the one in Substance Painter. The great thing about this workflow is you can go all creative as you want in Substance Painter. Just go to the RenderMan plugin and hit the export material button and then you can load it up in any DCC and get exactly the same result. It's a very nice and straightforward workflow and very easy to use. Now I want to show you the power of the Llama shading networks. The very beauty of this is it's a very modular shading network. So let's just start off with a simple diffuse material. So just create a Llama diffuse and hook it into your output collect, just like that. And you get a simple diffuse material. You can see the default is a neutral gray and you can see it's quite easily and it's working just as nice. So let's imagine we want to add a specular component, like a specular lobe on that. All we have to do is create a Llama dielectric and hook it up using the Llama layer. And that's quite easy to do. You, you just connect the diffuse to the base and then the dielectric to the top and hook that up into your output shader. And then you will see that you get a dielectric layer on top. And obviously you can always change your roughness values. You can be very flexible. It has very um, advanced settings, anisotropy, dispersion, um, interior scattering. So all the fancy stuff is available for the Llama dielectric. So now let's imagine we want to create a conductor material, some kind of metal. So all we have to do is create a llama conductor and then just hook it up into a shader and you will see that your material is now converted to a conductor material and the preset is like a gold material. But obviously now we lost our flexibility with the previous network. So what you can do is you can hook them up together. So you can, first of all, create a pixel metallic workflow, which is very handy because um, with that, you can hook up um, the basic substance painted textures quite easily. So how it works, you hook up the dedicated outputs to the dedicated um, lobes. So result diffuse will go into the color of the diffuse slot. And then you have specular face color, which will go to reflectivity. And you've got specular edge color, which will go to the edge color, obviously. And now you have this option here to control the metallicness with the slider. And as soon as I enable the metallic option, you will see that our shader gets metallic. Right now, if I disable metallic, you will not get our diffuse component. So what you need to do here is create a little mix. So we are mixing now our two different lobes, which is our diffused electric specular shader. And then I can use the mix of these two materials and I can drive the mix attribute using the metallic setting. So I can just copy this and paste it as a relative reference over. And now my material is dynamic because when I now switch it to be a metallic, it will still switch over to the conductor. And if I disable this, it should switch to the di dielectric material and you can see the same blue is applied. So all we have to do now is plug in a texture map or any kind of uh, material in our base color. And now we have the freedom to quickly switch oh, to a metallic or to a, um, a dielectric material. Now what we can also do, which is super nice, we can obviously go into the conductor, we can change the roughness of our base, met of our base metal. But let's say we want to create another specular lobe on top of this. All we have to do is create another dielectric and repeat the process as before. 
all we do is a llama layer, hook it up into our um, after our layer mix. This is our base. And then the second dielectric goes on to the top. And now you can see that our metal is coated with a nice uh, clear coat material. And this is the beauty of the Llama Shading Network. This was just a very brief introduction, but you can already see how modular this is. And this is not an uber shader, it's a modular shader. So you can make a shading network as complex as possible for your needs. It's very flexible and very powerful. So make sure to check it out and have fun with the Llama Shading Networks. Super amazing. Thank you so much for breaking that down, Arvid. I, I want to welcome now um, Vincent and uh, Dylan Sisson um, from our team to talk a little bit about um, Matt, the history, and, uh, the, and the teapot. So, um, hi, Vincent. Hey, Leif. How's it going? It's going, yeah, it's going well. You guys uh, can, can do yourself a little intro, and I'll leave you guys to your presentation. Good luck. Yeah, sure. So my name is Thanks, Vincent. Life. Hey, Dylan. How is it going, Dylan? Good. <laughs> good, good. Good to see you, Vincent. Okay, so uh, so yeah, I'm Vincent Go. I'm a senior technical artist and community manager at uh, Substance um, Adobe Substance 3D. Uh, so I've been here for a bit more than five years now. Uh, I'm coming from the video game industry, so a bit different. But since I, I've been joining. Uh, uh, Substance by Adobe. Uh, I've been uh, reaching lots of industry, including, uh, of course, uh, games, but VFX, animation, uh, and uh, luxury uh, ArcVis. So uh, super interesting to see all these three really industries uh, using these tools. And um, yeah, so I'm going to let you. That's a bit about me. So your turn, Dylan. Who are you? Um, my name is Dylan Sisson, and I joined uh, the Rainerman Group in 1999. And uh, my job is uh, uh, creating and designing the walking teapot. So um, that's what yeah, I do at Pixar. Right. So that's 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 why I'm that's why I'm in this talk. Yeah, so then, <laughs> the, 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 that's a good reason. I di I yeah. didn't design a uh, bitmap. Huh? Oh, if there is a, there was a doubt. But I, actually, I'm going uh, to 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 explain how uh, Matt, well, how we met Matt. Uh, that's a, a bit the idea. So. Yeah, please do. That sounds awesome. Okay, let's do that. And hi everyone. And uh, there is many uh, Spanish spoken in the chat. So that's hola uh, todos. Muy encantado ver que hay tanta tanta gente de hispanohablante. Okay, let's go. So basically, uh, everything we started with a shadow ball. If you work with materials, uh, you may know that it's important to to represent them and to be to make sure that they are represented well. Uh, so for this, we have what we call shadow balls. Um, and a few years ago, actually, we create uh, when uh, we were algorithmic, we created uh, uh, our own shadow ball. So we made sure, more or less, that it would ref represent the material is most of the conditions. Uh, so it was a job made by um, Jérôme Dorel, Anthony Salvi, and a bit Pierre Maheu, and many other artists. So it, it took some time because we, as we were doing at this time, just materials, it was uh, important to get, to have something that works. So this is that I'm explaining this because we, we are going to see why if you don't know Matt yet. Um, and what we like to do at uh, uh, Adobe Substance 3D and then Algorithmic was to organize uh, contests. We, we are doing a lot uh, each year. Uh, and we think it's really good for, uh, for people to have a good reason to, to play with our tool and to give them uh, yeah, some, some, some prizes and some inspiration and a, a point to start from. And for us, it's also good because it allows us to, to see how our tools are used. Um, so in 2017, we wanted to do one uh, specifically, specifically about Substance Painter, but what we wanted to do in that case is uh, to make it extremely accessible, as, as accessible as possible, because uh, we were heavily used already at this time, uh, and we had like crazy stuff made by the community, but some people who were watching at what was, what was produced could have been uh, intimidated uh, by the tool saying, well, maybe it's complicated, uh, before Substance 3D Painter, it, it was quite technical and uh, to, to do 
proper materials. So we say, how can we do this? So we decided to make a, a, a contest where people doesn't have to care about the model, they doesn't care about making good UVs, they just have to import uh, a model and texture it. So to cool. this, we say, okay, the inspiration, what could it be? And really quickly, after uh, brainstorming a bit uh, with many people uh, internally, we see uh, toy art can be a great inspiration uh, because uh, if you are uh, if you know a bit about toy art, the thing is generally you have this this shape that already exists, which is blank, and artists in real life, of course, just play uh, with it and just personalize it. So we say, oh wow, uh, that's perfect. So we decided to see if there was in our community, in our user, an artist who were who was doing stuff in toy art, and we had um, Damien Levoff. Um, who, who is an artist who worked at uh, Ubisoft uh, and, and, and many other places, but uh, he was making some stuff which were looking uh, a bit the, the way we wanted. So we contacted him and uh, he was more than happy to, to work with us. And what we say is, uh, okay, what we want is a toy art inspirational body, but the, the head has to be the shadow ball uh, because that's a bit our signature. So. Uh, and he did a great job. So yeah, he, he came with this, which was uh, extremely exactly what we want. So uh, basically, we didn't have to, to change the the shape. We did the we redid the UVs. We worked a bit on the topology, so it was a, a bit cleaner. But except this, that that was it. So it was extremely fast and we got that and from this we organized in april from april to may uh, 2017 our first meet mat contest um so cool. and yeah yeah it, it was yeah, actually it's really, a, tell me tell me Dylan. it's it's a great character I, I i really like like how it came out yeah i actually managed to keep it simple yet uh, quite iconic so um uh, and we say so we work Quite optimistic for for the contest. Generally, we had the best ones before was like 300 people or something like that. So we say, okay, we removed a lot of technical barriers, so we may reach uh, 400, 450, and finally it was a blast, and we have like more than 1,100 entries, something like that. So it was like a huge success. We were super happy, of course, and the community as well. And at the same time, we found we found uh, our mascots. So, it was great, uh, and basically, so obviously, we we did almost the way around than yourself. I, I don't know uh, yeah. because we we printed it after we made some version. I have one somewhere in a in a box, but as I'm packing right now, uh, I don't know where it is. But yeah, we made a few versions like this, who actually came with pencils, so people can uh, can uh, personalize them if they want. Uh, personally, I didn't because I'm too afraid to to scrap everything, so I don't touch it. But um, that's that's cool this way. Um, and you blanks. see our well, really old logo, so it, I, almost the logo is vintage right now. <laughs> so we also made a book with the winners uh, of the first edition. Uh, so with uh, Gabriel Lorazio made uh, made this uh, Van Gogh inspired. Uh, uh, Matt and it was we, so he won the contest and the thing is he, he really hand painted everything it, it's not a projection of a, of a painting or of a Van Gogh painting just hand painted everything so for us that was really uh, miraculous because that's exactly what we wanted to do and the best part is when we interviewed him after the contest he said oh yes uh, I've been using it for like a few weeks before, and I really love it. So he, he was quite new to the to the the tool, which was awesome for us because it's that's exactly what you want. Finally, that finally the the tool is a tool, but it's the artist who may who makes the difference. So so yeah, that's uh, that was awesome, honestly. And um, yeah, we we also have some printing after with Mimaki for the second contest. Uh, so the 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 Mimaki for people who don't know it's a three D printing company. They do printers, three D printers, high quality, and uh, so we partner with them and they three D printed the winners and the, the result is uh, it's quite awesome. What did we have as well? Yeah, uh, so people. Yeah, what we liked is beyond the contest, people starting using 
uh, using it for many different stuff that don't have any stuff. It, it, it really became iconic in the 3D materials and 3D world in general. Uh, and for example, uh, this is Quentin Langelet, uh, a French who were using it to, to make uh, a particle simulation. So he made uh, something that, yeah, the, this is quite cool. Uh, you can, um, I think he made something online and you can just uh, play with the, the mouse and it will deform uh, the particles, but coming back to, to Matt. So that's really cool to looks you like, make an object for a contest. And looks like Matt's hallucinating. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And what what else? Um, someone, I, I didn't have the video, but for uh, the second version, someone even made um, a video uh, of Matt. Uh, so he animated all the... So Pixar's guys uh, 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 write this name, Guillaume Marconi, because he's, uh, he's quite impressive. And the storytelling that he made uh, was so good that we had to create a new prize for him. Basically, with him, oh my oh. God, this is so good. He, he animated all the. Um, uh, yeah, he made, he, he made a movie basically uh, on the mad body. So that that was quite impressive. So, oh, I'll yeah. check that out. Just keep this awesome. name. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think uh, you, you could like it. I'm gonna have to watch this presentation later. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, and last year, uh, we organized Meet Matt 2, uh, because, yeah, why not? And uh, what we introduced in Meet Matt 2, we had to make uh, some changes on Matt because we introduced a displacement. So I guess most of you know what it is, but in, just in case, is uh, using a map to uh, move the mesh of a, a move a mesh. So you, uh, the, 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 the intensity, uh, the grayscale intensity of the map will deform the mesh. So for example, here, um, we had so we have to redo the whole topology to make sure that it deforms well, and actually this is the version of Matt that will be used for the the random man uh, with Matt uh, contest. Uh, for example, cool. here if you look at the presentation, all the details that are popping out of Matt are are not modeled or sculpted or sculpted outside of Substance Painter. Everything is made within Substance Painter, uh, so it gave a lot of possibilities and. We, we were super exciting to, to make this new contest, but we had a, a fear that for the first contest, we had like 1,000 entries. So will people be able to create new stuff uh, and to reinvent uh, or will they re reinvent the wheel? Because when you start with this, you know, you have made 1,000, it's super hard to, to come with something new. And, but of course, uh, they, they, uh, we really saw that really quickly they, they came with stuff crazy stuff and the displacement a lot stuff that were, weren't possible before and that's the good point you know you add a technical a new technical element but at the end what counts is the creative guys who are going to use it and make something that you don't expect that the best uh the best part of, of our job i would say for sure and now, I guess if you go on uh, either ArtStation or Behance or Google and you type Meet Matt, uh, you will see that there is like a huge amount of, of mats uh, outside. Um, and uh, even right now, out of the contest, some people are just starting from Matt and say, OK, I'm going to do a project. It's like a really iconic in the, in the material and texturing world right now, uh, which is the reason why we say at some point we discussed uh, we we were already partner, partnering with you guys uh, as a sponsor on other on uh, other contests, but we we were thinking about uh, Mad, who became more, more or less uh, iconic in the three D worlds, and uh, at some point we say, well, wait, uh, there is another object uh, who is a uh, super iconic, even more iconic uh, and famous uh, than Matt, which is of course the walking teapot, and we say, okay, this guy has have to meet. Uh, and then, but I, I, the thing is, uh, we don't know how they will meet. Uh, that that was the problem. So we needed a community. I, I remember uh, when yeah. when you brought us the idea of bringing Matt and the teapot together. We we thought, well, yeah, 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 yeah. That's it's, it's, that's, it's, that's that's so crazy. It just might work. Um, yeah, so exactly, we, don't, exactly. we don't we don't have any idea what people are going to do, but it's going to be fun, right? So yeah, it, um, it's going to be fun, and uh, will it be a nice encounter? Will it be like uh, they will they, will they fight? Uh, we, we we don't know. Will they be in love at first sight? Uh, and actually, we we don't want to or, give or all of the above. Maybe <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Yeah. Yeah. So but, uh, that that yeah. was the idea. Uh, so. And, and it's it's great to see like uh, we are our our teams kind of working together creatively and also technically on the on the plugin front and on the creative front. So, um, w would you like me to talk about the history of the walking teapot? Yeah, I think bit? it's uh, it's important. You you have some uh, nice uh, stuff to 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 share with the uh, with the community here. Oh uh, yes, oh, sorry, I'm, oh, I'm going to and, give a yeah, special special shout out. This is this was the last added. Uh, a slide uh, shoot uh, shoot out to Vlad who make this nice picture uh, to to illustrate the the contest, which is super cool. This is not random; it's random month, so this will be the only images <laughs> image who will not be which will not be in random month. This was was well, made with a, a substance restager, which is new, which is a staging rendering tool as well. Uh, not make to not made to make movie, but yeah, a good one as well. Uh, uh, but pretty. yeah, so this is Vlad who made this, and uh, yeah, it's, it's quite excellent. He's made it last, I don't know in how many days, but like, yeah, the, the, the image is cool. But yet, once again, you guys will decide how Matt and uh, the Walking Teapot will, will interact. Yeah, yeah. And let's see, I'll, we can pick up here. So the story of the Walking Teapot um, turns out that the... Um, it came out of, um, I was supposed to make a brochure for SIGGRAPH one year. And I thought, well, brochure is a piece of paper and a piece of paper is a piece of paper. It's not that fun. I thought, what if I put the brochure in a box with a toy and made the brochure kind of the instruction manual for the toy? And I was like, that sounds more fun. So maybe instead of working on the brochure, I'll just start working on this toy on the side and make that the brochure. And I thought about all the different things that it could be in the box. You know, could it be something from Pixar? Uh, or could it be something more specific just for RenderMan? And I began thinking about like the SIGGRAPH community and the computer graphics community and some of the things that are iconic about it. And one of them was uh, Martin Newell's uh, Utah Teapot. And it's, you know, everybody's used it. There's a procedural primitive in RenderMan actually called RI pot. So there's like RI sphere and there's all also RI teapot. So it's it's something that um, was part of computer graphics for a long time. I thought, well, that would be fun to do something with it. And I thought, what would you do with it? And I thought, well, you could make it walk. So I started emailing toy companies around the world and one wrote me back and said, yes, we'll make your teapot for you. So our brochure in 2003, um, turned out to be a teapot in a box. And we, we just had these boxes of teapots and nobody knew what they were. They'd walk up to our booth and they'd say, um, do you have a brochure uh, with information about RenderMan? And uh, we'd hand them a, a box with a teapot in it and they'd be like, what is that? And they'd say, that's our brochure. And then they'd be like, okay. And then they'd walk away. The next year, people still didn't know what it was. And then the third year, people started lining up for it. And um, since then, it's become a little more infamous, a little more famous, and we've had different versions every year. Here's a here's a chart of all the different versions. I don't know if if um, if you have any teapots, Vincent. Yeah, you, you must I have, have one the two. 2019 one. Uh, one. Uh, Sebastian, the the guy, I think had has a lot had a lot because he was doing like SIGGRAPH uh, since 2003. So in I think he doesn't have all of them, but he has most of them. Uh, in the chat, we, we're going to animate and do our job. In the chat, if you have write the, the number of teapots you have, it would be fun. Yeah, you should, uh, if you have teapots uh, in the chat. But uh, yeah, we could probably help hook Sebastian and, and you up with some teapots. I think we, we have some extra ones flying around. Yeah, somewhere. we are going to make some teapot yeah. mat trade. Yeah, we'll, we'll make a trade, we'll make a trade. Yeah. And so, so uh, there's lots of different teapots uh, that we've done through the years and I've designed them every year and sometimes they're based on a movie um, that has come out or sometimes they're based on a feature that's come out in the software and they're always kind of fun. So it's it's an inside joke. It's it's something that only people in the in our community are going to know about and anyone else, uh, you know, you know Pixar fans going to look at the teapot and be like, what is that? And you'll be like, it's the Utah teapot. This is the first model that was modeled for computer graphics in 1975. And um, what we all know that, so it's an inside joke. 
This year we have the Mechapod. And so this is uh, the model that we're going to be providing the challenge. And it's gonna be up to you, um, challengers, to um, decide whether you wanna use the internals or the externals or uh, make it opaque. You can do whatever you want. Maybe the teapots are uh, um, runaway Fabergé eggs or maybe they're window washers on a skyscraper. Um, maybe they're spy versus spy, I don't know. But um, it's up to you to find the most interesting narrative that you want to tell with these these two characters. So, and this is rendered in IPR live rendering session in a uh, Renderman XP. And it renders about um, two minutes. That's super cool. Yeah. So we're we're, yeah, we're um, happy with. If there is some riggers, if there is some riggers, they know how the rig is made now, so they can use it to, the, to animate it. It's true, and uh, you could actually print that out and. Um, probably get it to, to walk around, which is um, cool if you're into that sort of thing. I don't know if you're into 3D printing, Vincent, but... Um, I'm not personally, cool. but I, I have some, some colleagues that, that will be for sure. And uh, just here's SIGGRAPH, here's the teapot line. People started lining up, they wanted the teapot, so we brought them. Um, one year, that black box in the middle um, is the Pixar booth. That red line is the line for the teapots that actually went out of the ex exhibition floor door. And people wanting to get into SIGGRAPH uh, exhibition were getting into the teapot line. So the line got super long and the uh, conference organizers told us not to do that anymore. So it was long. <laughs> I, I know that people probably don't believe me. So uh, we have a movie queued up and ready to go to show you what it was like back in 2010 when you could have two or 3,000 people getting in line waiting for uh, the release of a walking teapot. Um, and I think we're going to be, be um, playing the movie any second. Isn't that true? No. Yeah. We have to ask how many missed conferences did <laughs> for, for to have the teapot. <laughs> Uh, exactly. Look, talks, exactly. missed talks, sorry. But you have to walk um, to get the teapots. It was, um, people spent a lot of time in line. And here, here is the line. So, you know, this is a conference, a visual effects conference, where there are speakers, uh, the speakers uh, that are the height of their uh, specialities um, in, in different emerging techniques and computer graphics. And, um, these people, instead of going and listening to some of these people talk about uh, this new technology, decide that they want to stand in line for several hours um, instead of that. And um, it's it's kind of it's kind of impressive just because there's so many people standing in line, I guess, you know. And you know, every day we would give away maybe a thousand teapots or, or so, and every day maybe four thousand people would stand in line. So it was kind of Kind of exciting. Anyway, so the, the point is, is that people stood in line to get the teapots. Uh, yeah, 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 they are, they are, they are but, but they seem to be happy, so. Yeah. They it's seem live. to be happy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, live it's live right now. <laughs> it is, it is, it is like right now. And let's see, in the art challenge, I'll go back to that. And here we are. So the teapots traveled around the world. Uh, people got, took the teapot brought the teapot to the Grand Canyon or to Venice or Finland or even Pixar or FMX. Um, some people, um, you know, travel down to the geographic South Pole and, uh, you know, over the winter, maybe there's eight people that they're there the entire time. And um, I knew one of them and they took a walking teapot down and put it on top of the geographic South Pole. So I think this is only swag that has been at the bottom of the world, so. But maybe it's from the in Rundle Man and you don't tell it. <laughs> it's oh, I wouldn't do that to you, Vincent. I'm I'm a straight shooter. Yeah. Um, it was to give compliments with the render quality of Rundle Man. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, there's the uh, teapot museum that travels around with us to SIGGRAPH. And we have teapot, you know, it's become collectible. So some people have uh, um, almost all of them. And some people go a little crazy trying to collect them all. So um, uh, here's some recent bid, one, one went for 414 US dollars, which 
Um, seems like a lot since I know how much they cost to make. And the teapot's a bit of a celebrity. Uh, it's been in a music video. It, it makes cameos in all of our Render Man challenges. And most importantly, the teapot's about camaraderie, about our community, and uh, kind of the, the, the special stuff we talk about. And um, getting together at uh, SIGGRAPH, giving the teapots to everybody is just something that is nice for, for, for our community. And we're excited to partner with Adobe, with Matt, and expand those communities and bring those two mascots together to have who knows what kind of fun. So uh, that's it from me about the uh, walking teapot. And yeah, um, impressive. It was uh, the, 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 the picture for, was from last year, the picture of uh, the cigarette? Uh, this one? I, uh, I 2019, think, no? I think this is 2019, yeah. Okay. yeah. It should be on the top left. It was, oh. Let's see if you, anyway. Well, we well, can I, I won't find myself. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, that's great. awesome. Well, well um, th thanks for uh, talking about Matt with us. And I'm glad I got to share yes. a little bit about the teapot with you. And I'm looking forward to seeing what people do with the um, um, with this contest. So, Yeah, that, that, this will be exciting for sure. Thanks again for having me here. And um, now I think we're going to talk about the future direction of the technology and bring on Oliver Meisenberg. And Oliver is the vice president of uh, RenderMan at Pixar. And hey, Oliver. Hey, thank you for the presentation. And uh, yeah, those, those images make me jealous of seeing people in a big room. I definitely want to go back oh. next year. So hopefully we me, can me too. that one really quick. Um, yeah, it's going to be an awesome challenge. Uh, thank you, Dylan. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really keen to see what you guys come up with. Uh, there's a great opportunity. And uh, there's nothing uh, greater than having two creative companies, Adobe and Pixar, working together on a great challenge. I think everyone's focusing on, on the artist itself. And so we see, uh, we, we're keen to see what you come up with and uh, share the results with the rest of the community. Um, Next up, we invite, invite uh, Guido Caroni, uh, who's the senior director of the Substance team, uh, to talk about the future tech coming out of Adobe and also what that means for collaborating in the future with the Renamed team. Hey, Guido. Hello. Hi. Uh, it's good to see good to see you. Uh, so um, I think I, let's see if we can get the slide. Uh, up, okay, so yes, um, I'm. Uh, my name is Guido Quaroni. I've been at Adobe uh, since the beginning of the year. Uh, Pixar before then, so it's good to see a bunch of uh, uh, old friends. And uh, I'm I'll, I'm a senior director of engineering of the 3D and immersive group. And I'm going to be talk a little bit about uh, some of the recent releases we had and look a little bit into the future as well. Um, in uh, the, you know, a little bit more than a month ago, we introduced a, a new suite of products, and we call it the Adobe Substance 3D. And uh, these products are uh, there are new products, and some existing from the um, previous offer, Algorithmic, and also Adobe. Uh, so the, the new one is Modeler. We introduced like a, a modeling tool that is still in beta. It's going to be released in a few months. That is a you know kind of a sculpting, uh, SDF-based uh, modeling tool, and it's kind of an evolution of um, medium then we have a uh, painter that you see in the demo uh, designer our procedural uh, network uh, creation tool for shaders but also now for geometry for procedures procedural geometry and then we have sampler that is used to be called the alchemist for procedural texture and material uh, creation and stager that is our kind of a staging for a uh, tool for virtual photography so when uh, uh, on top of the introducing this application we also introduce a new uh, material. It's called the Adobe Standard Material Definition. It's a physically based material and is an evolution of uh, a previous material used at Adobe. And the purpose is to have a consistent look across all 3D application within Adobe, and but also be able to um, see if we can you know, uh, have a, a mechanism to transport this material also outside our products. So right now, the Adobe material, standard material, has um, an implementation in MDL, and we're looking at Material X also as a way to encode this material so it can travel, you know, can be obviously provide consistent um, uh, look across the Adobe product, but also uh, outside. 
and the material is a more of a along the line of a PXR surface so it's kind of a monolithic is different than llama that is based on component and also because the goal of this material was to make it user friendly and uh, you know uh, easy to 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 set all the different uh, parameters and properties on top of that also we introduce a new uh, rendering suite we call it the mercury rendering engine and it's actually a set of technologies in a way combined with the unified api and to provide rasterization and path tracing and again the same goal here is this is a, an engine that we want to have across all our app to maintain consistency and a, a look uh, depending on where, um, you know, independently where you're looking and authoring uh, your data. On top of that, also this is uh, with this engine that is have both GPU and CPU implementation is also varies depending on the platform. Is designed also for looking at the scale, you know, because we introduced the, this new procedural geometry system in Designer, and so easily you can get lots of geometry, but also you want to take advantage of instancing and um, other technologies. So fundamentally, those are kind of the two rendering technologies, you know, having a consistent material uh, and standard material and also have a consistent rendering engine across the different products. I just want to talk a little bit about looking ahead, you know, what are we thinking in terms of like, you know, uh, you know, our products and uh, where we want to go. Um, but again, first, first thing is uh, interoperability. You know, we have five applications. We may have more in the future and Adobe has a lot of other a suite of application and we believe fundamentally in having kind of an ecosystem of apps that are very specialized for different workflows but is key to them to function properly is to be able to interop within each other but also uh, interop you know with the rest of the industry so for example you know the classic workflow can be like you're modeling something and this is like a, the modeler uh, environment and then you want to go for loop development and texturing and so you move into a uh, painter and finally, in Stager, you will do the final renders, you know, lighting, camera work, composition, and final render. And again, how do we make this uh, as seamless as possible? Now, with the new launch, we introduce some of the workflow, like we have a send to, we call it, you know, across some of the apps where as you work in an application, you can automatically send your work and launch the other ones and continue from there. But also, we are, we are looking at also to get more on the data model representation that you know, not necessarily today is consistent. And so that's why we're looking at USD. So uh, this is an area where we, uh, we just started, you know, kind of an investment. We have some support for USD, like Painter can export USD files, Stager can import USD file, but we're looking at really having like a common data model across all the apps. So we have a strong consistency as, a, as data moves between all these applications. And also at the same time, because we're seeing USD taking off quite nicely uh, in a bunch of other third-party application, you know, leveraging that. So in the, in the months to come, this is an area where, you know, currently we're exploring it and we're definitely looking at how to enhance and push it um, to the next level. The other area that we're looking at is platforms. You know, again, today, most of these applications are traditional desktop application. Modeler is the first one that actually has a, a kind of a dual mode where you can use it in VR and also you can use it on the desktop and uh, we want to continue to push uh, this paradigm. So when we look at all the platform out there, you know, we have the traditional workstation. Now we're seeing more and more super powerful laptops that you can use for your creative work, but definitely looking at tablets, you know, web and uh, uh, immersive like devices like uh, VR. And this is where I you know we are spending a, you know, a good amount of time thinking, how do we how do we leverage the, them all? And it, it's been really exciting to see what's that, what's happening with uh, Modeler, where again, you're working on something and you put the VR goggles on, you work in the VR space, you put the VR goggle off, the system detects you're now not in VR and it starts behaving like a desktop application. And so if you think about that paradigm, you know, uh, pushing it even further. And that's where the viewport is really the key component of this vision. Because this, you know, traditionally you have most of the application have a viewport, you have inspector, your browsers, you know, libraries. But then, you know, if you start looking at multiple surfaces, you want to see, okay, maybe it's like something more along like there is a 3D kind of a user interface, and that user interface can, uh, you know, adapt depending on what surfaces you are, and um, and really focus on what does it mean like working in the image. One of the technology that we're also looking to help with that uh, uh, vision is Hydra. Because again, we, 
we want to make sure as much as possible the application have a consistent way to communicate to viewports and have you know hydra is this layer that allows to connect you know application with multiple rendering engines and that's what we're looking at as a possibility for us to have unification about how application think about what the viewport uh, api could be and then at the hydra level thinking about what devices i'm running on i'm on a vr device i'm on a desktop i'm on a tablet i'm on a web browser and see how that can help us to provide more uh, consistency and give us pretty much velocity at the end of the day to be able to adopt uh, more surfaces um, as fast as we can. So uh, that's in a nutshell, you know, really brief, but, uh, you know, we have, you know, introduction, you know, the materials was uh, the, the definite pillar, having a standard material and a consistent rendering story. But now looking at, again, at uh, interop multi-surfaces and a powerful viewport. And I, as, as you've seen, putting also the RenderMan option there because ultimately we want some of our apps specifically like Painter or Designer to be able to work while you're working in Painter, you can connect to the render of your of choice. It doesn't have to be necessarily ours, but it can be a uh, RenderMan. Well, that was amazing. Thank you so much, Guido, for telling us a little bit about the uh, future of Adobe and Substance 3D tools. Um, you know, we're, we, uh, we've, we've tried to really answer all the questions in the questions tab, and we're cutting it really close for this uh, time slot. So we're gonna thank Garrett, all our guests for coming in and, and uh, listening uh, to all this creativity take place. And I wanna see you guys in the challenge. There, there's an, also an amazing um, AR teapot challenge going on right now with uh, awesome prices. So a lot of, of ways to be on Instagram and, and take pics and be creative. So thank you so much again, guys. and. And uh, stay tuned for the next uh, scheduled presentation for Blender. All right, guys. Bye.